Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, for because most of you are viewing this remote, I'll go um, over the beginning five minutes again, uh, just very briefly. Um, so. Homework will be posted later today, and most of the thing you need for the homework uh, will be discussed in today's class. Uh, you'll probably all do the homework on Google Colab, which will be the easiest, unless you have GPUs at hand. So today we'll talk about Keras, which is one of the high-level libraries for doing deep neural networks. It's quite similar to um, uh, Torch NN, and um, then we'll talk about a specific kind of neural networks, convolutional neural networks, which are mostly used for image recognition, but also for um, video or audio data. So we'll start with uh, an introduction to the Keras sequential interface. Keras actually has uh, several different interfaces, particularly the sequential and the functional. We'll only focus on a sequential interface. And I uh, apologize to all the people who just already heard this with me not recording it. Um, so the sequential uh, interface defines a neural network as a sequence of steps. So here I'm using two different kinds of layers, a dense layer, which is a matrix multiplication, and an activation layer, which is an activation function. And so I can specify network as uh, a list of these layers. So here, um, I specify my model as being a sequential model where the first layer is a dense layer with 32 hidden units and uh, then an input shape of 784. So this means the number of input features. Then there's an activation layer, which is a rectified linear unit. And then there's uh, another dense layer, since it's the last layer, it will be the output layer with a softmax activation. So this is a network for classifying MNIST. Uh, with 784 input features and uh, 10 class classification tasks. For the first uh, layer, we need to specify the input shape so the network can allocate the uh, uh, right sizes of matrices. For all the subsequent layer, the network can automatically determine the input uh, size from the previous layer. So here, this first dense layer will be a matrix of 784 times 32. The second one will be 32 times 10. We can also specify the model by um, starting with an empty sequential model and then adding layers one by one. So here I'm starting with an empty model, add, an, add a dense layer, and then add an activation layer, and I could keep on adding another dense layer, and so on. And finally, um, basically, the shortest uh, version is to also specify the activation just inside the dense layer. So you don't actually have to specify the activation as a separate thing, but you can just say, I want a dense layer with this activation function. So here, this would be a very simple way in Keras to specify a neural network with a thing, single hidden layer. It's a very small hidden layer with only 32 units uh, to classify the MNIST data set. Um, one function that I think is very, very helpful in uh, Keras is the summary, or method, I should say, uh, summary method, uh, which tells you all of the layers that you have and um, the output shape of each of the layers and the number of parameters in each of the layers. And so here you can see the uh, first layer has an output shape of 32, the second layer uh, which is the output layer has an output shape of 10. Um, the number of learnable parameters uh, is this in the first layer. Uh, maybe easier to compute in your head is the one in the second layer. So this is uh, the size of the matrix is 32 times 10, which gives you 320 parameters. And then there's another 10 that are the bias vector for the output layer, leading to 330 learnable parameters in the second layer. And so this here is 32 times the size of the input features plus 32. As I said before, um, this um, the number of trainable parameters is uh, one way to character characterize the number of vulnerable or the degrees of freedom in the network and the network complexity. 
And so here, even though this is basically a tiny neural network with only 30, with only one hidden layer with only 32 units, we have uh, 25,000 learnable parameters. Uh, before you can start learning the model, uh, you basically can finalize uh, the model with the compile um, method uh, where you set, set the optimizer and the loss and uh, potentially which kind of metrics you want to optimize, uh, you want to lock during learning. So here I'm using the atom optimizer. There's many optimizers in, um, in Keras and um, so Adam is a pretty good default choice, but uh, you can you should check out the documentation to see what else is there and what else is recommended. As I said, this uh, changes uh, pretty quickly. Uh, for classification, you need to use categorical cross entropy. Uh, if you have a softmax output, this is what you need to specify. And then for metrics, I am uh, say I'm monitoring accuracy. So this is just to monitor the convergence of the network and to measure the generalization performance. Then to train the model, I also actually called the fit method, uh, such, uh, the same as in scikit-learn. There's um, a couple of differences in that in Keras, the fit um, um, method actually takes several more arguments. In scikit-learn, fit only takes x and y. In Keras, it also takes the batch size, the number of epochs, whether to use validation um, data, and so on. And so here, I'm setting the batch size to 32. So this is, again, this is like a tuning parameter, but things like 32 or 64 are pretty common. Um, there's ways to do early stopping. Um, I'm not sure if I have this on the slides, otherwise you can just check out the documentation. Uh, for early stopping, you would need a, a validation split. So you can either set a validation split to a float, which will then split off part of your data automatically, or you can explicitly pass validation data like a fixed set of data as a NumPy matrix on a pair array. Um, another thing that's slightly different is that you have to um, do a one-hot encoding of the target variable. So the output layer uh, for a 10-class classification date, uh, task like MNIST has 10 units, and so you need to have the uh, target vector in the correct shape. So the target vector needs to be a vector of length 10 to match the output layer. So what I'm doing here is some... Um, just some pre-processing for uh, learning a network on the MNIST data set. There's a loader uh, in Keras. I, um, it's actually loaded as images, so I reshape it, I make it float, I divide it by 255, which is the maximum. Um, there's 60,000 training samples and 10,000 test samples, so this is sort of a, a classical split from the literature. And then um, I use Keras due to also too categorical to do basically a one-hot encoding of the uh, target, um, saying that there's 10 classes in total. So now I have prepared my X train and Y train and X test and Y test. Oh, there's a question. Um, why is 255 the max? Okay, so this is uh, basically I know this. Uh, because I've uh, worked with the MNIST data set uh, for 10 years, 11 years. Um, so the MNIST is grayscale images between 0 and 255. So it's unsigned integer, it's, well, it's unsigned character, so it's number from 0 to 255. Um, neural networks uh, work much better with scaled data, so I scale it to be between 0 and 1 by dividing it by 255. Um, so I could have used the min-max scaler, um, but actually that would do a per pixel um, scaling, but I actually want to do a global scaling. I want to make sure that the uh, pixel value of white is zero and the pixel value of black is one. 
this is sort of a scaling that works best for this data set. Um, and so basically, everybody knows the maximum of MNIST is 255, and you need to divide it by 255 to learn on it. That's sort of uh, poke knowledge. All right, so now after I did the pre-processing, I can just call fit. Um, okay, here I specified a batch size as 128. Um, probably doesn't matter that much in this context, and I want for 10 epochs. Uh, the loss that is shown here is the, excuse me, is the uh, cross entropy loss. So the loss decreases as I'm training, uh, whereas the accuracy, this is the training accuracy since I didn't specify a validation set, the training accuracy increases, and in the end, it's 97% accurate, which is not very good for MNIST, but given that our neural network is tiny and I'm learning this on the CPU of my laptop for only 10 epochs, that's kind of fine. So now if I also want to use a validation set, then I can specify validation split. In this case, I do uh, equal to 0.1. So this means from the train data set, 10% will be held out for validation set. And so it'll show me um, the loss on the training set, the accuracy on the training set, the uh, loss on the validation set and the accuracy on the validation set. And so the thing that I'm really interested in is um, the one on the right-hand side, this is the generalization accuracy. But um, generally, during training, what you're sort of guaranteed is that the training loss will decrease. That's the only, th only thing that you're more or less guaranteed during training. Um, and then, uh, but what you're really interested in is the validation accuracy. And so here, given that the network is tiny, it actually, it doesn't start overfitting, so, um, but it, and it still sort of improves. So maybe I should just wait longer here, but probably I should just uh, do a bigger network. So this is like, just to make clear, this is like a tiny network, and probably people would not use this in practice. It's, uh, I just want to show off the interface uh, without uh, being too hard on my laptop. I probably should redo this on my gaming PC um, to have a little bit more realistic network. So then I can um, evaluate this on the test set. Um, the method that's used for that is evaluate, but this is similar to uh, score in scikit-learn, and it uh, gives you actually a tuple which contains the loss and the accuracy, and potentially something else also. And so the loss is uh, this year, this again, this is the cross entropy loss, and the accuracy is 69.6%. Uh, again, not very good, but it, this is a tiny network and I was being lazy. I'll make a note of running this on my GPU again. Um, All right, so um, if you want to see a little bit more detail what's happening, there's actually um, a callback that is returned from the fit method. Uh, this one, the simplest one is history callback. And so um, this will store all of the results in a very nice way. And uh, so if I call fit, and uh, when I then after the fit look at the results, I can look at the history callback dot history. This is a dictionary, um, but I'll make it into a data frame and plot it. And then here I get actually this pretty nice visualization that shows the, um, the loss, the validation loss, uh, the accuracy and the validation accuracy. Actually, so here if I look at the validation loss, I can see this, the, lo the validation loss is actually in, uh, increasing. So you could argue it's already overfitting here. Uh, somewhat. Um, cool. So, okay. So there's a question which uh, is 
is there a way to decide whether we should use a shallow network or a deep ne network, or should we just decide by trial and error? Um, and that's actually a very complicated question. There's, um, so th my usual principle is start with the simplest thing possible and then make it complicated, and then start making it more and more complicated. I probably wouldn't start as simple as I did here. Maybe I would start with a single hidden layer with uh, like 100 uh, units or 500 or something like this. Um, my other advice, uh, particularly for neural networks, is do what other people did. There is a lot of effort going into finding good architectures. And um, we probably don't have time to go into this into more detail, but basically um, the big research labs, and in particular the big companies, run giant searches over good architectures. They use genetic programming to find out how should they assemble an, uh, the networks on particular data sets. And they waste like GPU years on this. So unless you're Google, you probably can't do as much trial and error as Google did. And so it's a good idea to um, stick with the architectures that people discovered. You can definitely do some reasoning and you can definitely do some trial and error yourself. But um, I think one of the um, best ways to go in uh, neural networks is learn from what others did. Probably someone, even if someone didn't solve exactly the same task you did, someone probably solved a very similar task. And particularly, like if I go for MNIST, I can like, there's many, many, many examples for MNIST and I can easily find the one that's currently state of the art and just download that architecture. And if I don't ha actually want to do MNIST, but I want to do something similar, maybe a similar architecture would work. And uh, if you have a completely different domain, there's probably someone else that applied new networks to a different domain, and you can figure out what they used. Um, if you want to start from scratch, I would start from something that's pretty simple and shallow and go deeper from there. Also, smaller networks train faster, so um, you'll have a more uh, direct feedback loop, uh, and so you'll figure out, is it working at all? Uh, more quickly. So, um, Keras also has uh, wrappers for scikit-learn if you want to use grid search CV or any of the other scikit-learn models uh, or tools uh, called the Keras classifier and the Keras regressor. And the Keras classifier uh, basically, um, because the Keras sequential model doesn't have entirely the same interface as scikit-learn. Uh, basically, you need to wrap it into such a Keras classifier. And uh, the way this, is, this works is that you define a function that would return the model. So make model is something that takes some arguments, so you can put in whatever arguments you want. Then uh, you create the model object can do compile and then you return the model. And um, now, if you wrap Keras classifier, sorry, if you wrap this make this uh, make model, which is a function, into Keras classifier, the CLF thing will behave like a scikit learn model. And uh, we saw before, uh, Keras actually has some arguments in fit, like batch size and epochs and so on. If in the Keras classifier, these will actually became, become um, uh, parameters of the constructor so that you can then use grid search, grid search CV to search over a number of epochs. And uh, any of the arguments of your function here will also just become parameters um, that uh, you can tune. This is maybe not the most effective way to tune neural networks. Um, the techniques that we talked about uh, before spring break and doing Bayesian optimization or doing randomized search might be better. There's also randomized search in scikit-learn. There's uh, soon there's going to be success of halving in scikit-learn. 
uh, these are the techniques you might want to use instead. But um, basically, if you ha already have a framework set up that assumes a scikit-learn compatible model, you can wrap um, a Keras model using scikit-learn, uh, using Keras classifier and Keras regressor to get something that behaves just like a scikit-learn model. Oh yeah, so here for my tiny network, I did um, a, a parameter search. And uh, you can see that actually, so again, these are all like tiny because I did this on my little, um, on my little CPU here. Um, but you can see that doing 10 epochs with 256 hidden units uh, basically got perfect training results and also got the best test results. So this is still not good by any measure. So you can get uh, probably about 99% accuracy on the test set if you really tune it. Um, so again, I got a question about, so how do you decide on the architecture? Um, I think uh, I tried to answer this before, basically saying, do what other people did, look at similar problems, look at the literature in your domain uh, and apply those. The, uh, the architectures rapidly change that people use. So um, if I like gave you any intuition, then that intuition might be like from the last time I did some uh, you know, network uh, construction, but since then the intuition changed three times because people really, really change how they construct networks. And there's been a lot of research going on recently. Um, again, I would sort of start with simple thing, things. So the, yeah, the two starting points is start simple and go more complex or start with um, things that have been used in the literature and worked well on similar problems. Oh, there's, there's a really good question, um, which is someone, uh, I was asking, uh, it's not true that it's, or is it true that you can't overfit by increasing the size of the neural network? And um, so there's actually really interesting work by um, uh, my colleague Daniel Su, on uh, who's outside Colombia, um, on interpolating classifiers, and so basically, um, I think the wisdom these days is that overfitting might actually not be a problem, um, in a sense that you can have neural networks that are huge and um, have basically more floating point numbers in there than the data set has, and they still learn really, really well. This is still not super well understood. It's something that is, there's a very active area of research. Um, but it definitely depends on the structure of the neural network. If I create, like on, on this task, if I just create a neural network, on MNIST that has like uh, 100,000 hidden units and 100,000 hidden units and 100,000 hidden units and 100,000 hidden units 10 times and then try to do bug propagation, this thing will probably never learn. Uh, similarly, if I just um, create one with like, as a, has 100 hidden units per layer and I create 100 uh, layers, this will also never learn. Um, so it it is, but the reason of that is that the back propagation will actually not, not be able to find a good optimum. And we'll talk about this more next time. Basically, if you make your neural network too deep, unless you're using tricks, then um, deep networks cannot be learned. They, cannot, they will not even be able to fit the training data set. And so this is sort of uh, maybe not related to overfitting, it's related to fitting. So the optimization will fail if you make your network too big, unless you use tricks. Um, so.
So I, I wouldn't say that you can, like, you can probably also, you can overfit and build a network that works really well and um, on the training set, but not on a test set. But many of the best performing models actually have, um, uh, are very over parameterized. So they are actually huge models, like the biggest, mo really, really big models tend to perform better if they're trained long enough. But it's not just any model, people architected them um, very carefully and added in the complexity in a way that's very careful. So uh, another question is, isn't more layers indicative of more parameters and therefore it's more likely to overfit, especially if not enough training data is present? So the answer to this again is twofold. There's one aspect is the optimization aspect. If you make a very deep network, it will just not learn unless you're using tricks. It will, if, you, if you do the thing that I just did with the sequential network and you add 100 layers, it will not fit the training data set. So it will not only not overfit, it will just not fit at all. Um, and that's something that people struggled a lot with like in the, um, in the 90s, but then actually up to like in the in the 2010s, um, and so uh, residual networks were sort of one way to overcome this, and we'll talk talk about this uh, next time. So, if you make a huge network and don't think about optimization too much, it will just not learn. So we'll, it will not overfit, but it also won't fit the training data set. If you get it to fit the training data set people found that actually there's a good chance it will generalize well, even though it would does perfect a job on the train data set, uh, the performance on the validation data set might actually still be good. And why that is, is sort of an area of active research. And I should really be going on. Um, I mean, this is a super interesting topic and it's, uh, Maybe I'll add a couple more slides up, uh, on this for next uh, lecture, but actually the, basically people find that the conventional wisdom of model complexity and overfitting doesn't really seem to apply to neural networks. All right, so for the rest of the lecture, I want to talk about convolutional neural networks, which are, basically one specific architecture that, as I said, is mostly used for images, but also used for uh, 1D signals or 3D signals and so on. So the main idea is that if you're uh, working on images, then you would like your uh, model to be invariant to small translations. If I show you an image, and then if I move the content of the image a little bit, you are still e uh, able to recognize um, what's in the image. So if you look at my video screen, and you can recognize me, if I go over here, you can still recognize me. Actually, the lighting changed, but it was even harder than, um, than just movement. If I go over here, you'll also recognize me, even though, again, lighting changed. But like, um, in particular, you want this translation to not change your recognition. Like it doesn't matter where something is in an image, it should be a, you should be able to recognize it. And so you want to encode this translation in variants. One way to encode this translation variants is to uh, have something that is called weight sharing, which means that you apply the same weights so the, the same weight matrices, the same coefficients to different locations in the image. And this is, this, these two concepts are implemented using convolutions. So here's the mathematical definition of a convolution um, on 1D functions. This is maybe not the most helpful way to write it down, but I wanted to start with the mathematical definition before I go into um, the more, a more intuitive approaches. So you can 
the convolution is defined between any two functions over the integers. So f and g, they're both functions over all integers. And so uh, f convolved with g, convolution is often written as a star, is sum of from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity um, over m, f of m times g of n minus m. which is actually symmetric in n and m. So this is the same as um, f of n minus m uh, times g of m. So you're kind of going, you're multiplying the entries of f and g, which are like infinitely dimensional, uh, infinitely long vectors. And um, you, go, but you're going, uh, as you're going one step in one, you're going a step in a different direction of the other one, and then you multiply them and you sum all of them together. And this will give you, again, a function that is defined over all the integers. What we usually have is that we don't have functions that are defined over all the integers, but we have a signal um, that has like some finite length. And you can assume, if you think of it as like an infinitely long sequence, you just think everything else is zero. And so here I have my signal f, which is this 1D array. And um, then I have another function um, that I call a filter. And so in this definition of convolution, uh, it's actually sym symmetric in f and g, but very often we think of one of them to be our signal or our data, say f. Here, it's just a 1D thing, but you can think of this as like an image or a time series or um, a sound wave or a 3D MRI image. And uh, on this data, we have some operation um, that we often call a filter or kernel uh, G. And here, this, this G actually is uh, something like the discrete um, Laplacian. So this is actually something like computing the second derivative of uh, of a discrete signal, but it doesn't matter so much. But let's say we want to apply this operation um, on f. We can do this with a convolution. And so the way a convolution is defined is that if I want, uh, so basically I'm overlaying uh, the filter and the original series, and then I slide the filter along the series to get the, the first number of my result. I multiply 0 and minus 1, which is 0. I add to it 1, then I multiply by 2, which is 2. And I add to that 2 times minus 1, which is uh, minus 2, so I get 0 overall. So applying this filter that I hold, uh, uh, this filter g to the first three entries, I get 0. Applying it to the next three entries, I compute minus 1 times 1, 2 times 2, minus 1 times 0 and sum all of it up, and I get, uh, wait, what do I get? Oh, uh, yeah, and I get three, because it's four minus one. And uh, then I keep sliding this filter, and for the next entry, I compute minus one times two, zero times two, minus one times one, and sum them all up, and I get minus three. And so, um, Basically, this way, I get a new vector f convolution g. That is, this filter applied to all possible entries um, in f. The way it's done here, there's actually, there's like, um, uh, a slight complication with the, how do you want to deal with boundaries or a choice you can make. Um, so here I started applying um, G so that all of the entries of G have a uh, matching entry of F. Now, uh, so that this minus one lines up with the first entry of F. As a result, the outcome I have will be start 
one index uh, further in, and it will be one shorter. So um, if I do it like this, the result of f convolution g will have length, the length of f, minus 2, because I don't have an entry that corresponds to the first entry. I don't have an entry that will correspond to the last entry. This is known as a valid convolution, and I really should have a, a nicer slide to explain valid convolutions. I can also do a full convolution. A full convolution would start with G being uh, one step further to the right, and I would pad F with zeros, and then I would have F convolution G would have the same length as F. That would be a full, con uh, sorry, that would be a, a convolution that's called same. Same because the output will have the same shape as the input. I could also go even one step further and pad with um, two zeros. This would be called a full convolution. Then um, the output would basically be the, comp the combined size of f and g. Actually, it will be uh, No, okay, yeah, the output will for uh, for full would be actually yeah, just the com the combined size of f and g. I tend to make off by one errors when I uh, when I compute the size of convolutional results in my head, but I think I'm fine. Here's an example of. Um, what a convolution might look like in the 1D case. So here I have, uh, this is like some stock data. I'm not sure if it was real or if I just simulated it. Um, so that's a 1D signal, and one day to smooth the signal is to um, do a convolution, either with a box filter or with a Gaussian filter. And so here I'm using this Gaussian filter. So this would be my F, and this would be my G. And if I compute a convolution, um, with f between f and g, I get this, which is like a much more nicely smooth series. And the width of this kernel, or the width of this filter, depends um, determines how much I smooth it. This is like a very standard uh, use of um, of convolutions, just doing smoothing. We'll mostly talk about images. So in images, um, both the signal and the filter will be 2D. So here, um, for now, assume we just have a grayscale image. So it's just a single 2D array. So I, I took this from a blog post on uh, Towards Data Science by uh, Arden uh, Dertat. This blog post is actually quite nice in uh, explaining convolutional neural networks. So go check it out if you like. Um, so here on the left-hand side, you can see the source image. Uh, typically, you would have entries between 0 and 255 in there. But here, for illustration purposes, he just made it the entries between 0 and, uh, and 6, I guess. And then you'll have a filter. In this case here, he, he did a Sobel filter, which is basically a, a, a smooth gradient. And so if I want to apply this filter to this 2D image, I move both horizontally and vertically. So to get the result at this place, I do pointwise multiplication of 3 times minus 1, 0 times 0, 1 times 1, 2 times minus 2, 6 times 0, and so on. And then I add up all of the result. And this will give me the result for the central pixel. Then I move this guy, this filter, over one to the right, and I get the result for the next one. Oh, I got a question which says, can you explain my, uh, what's saying that the filter is a smooth gradient? Um, it actually doesn't matter that much because we will think about, we will learn the filters in our neural networks. The filters correspond to the weights. But um, here, what he used was a Sobel filter. Um, 
which is if what happens if you call, uh, compute the derivative of a two-dimensional Gaussian and then discretize it. And I'm not sure if that was a useful uh, thing, but basically what this, will, this is, is the, it computes the gradient in the x direction um, over the, of the signal that you're, uh, that you're doing, applying the convolution to. But this is just, he, he just picked this filter for illustration purposes. Uh, but what we'll do is we will learn this filter kernels uh, in our neural networks. Here's another great uh, illustration using um, an animation where you can basically see the filter being uh, slided over the original data. So here the filter is uh, the second number and the entry is the first number. And you can see um, how each uh, position of the filter creates one output pixel, basically. So one question is, would this be considered a form of dimensionality reduction? And um, I mean, I think by itself not, because um, it can actually, like if you do a full convolution, you actually increase the number of points. If you do a smoothing and then a subsampling, then you're um, decreasing the resolution. But I guess people wouldn't, would usually think of this as resolution and not dimensionality. Um, I mean, resolution is the dimensionality of the, of the, um, of the signal, but in this case, it's like very tied to the 2D layout of, um, of the signal. So I don't think people would usually call this dimensionality reduction. So here's an example of what this filter will do on uh, a 2D signal. Uh, this is a photo I took in where I used to live in, uh, in the East Village. Um, uh, it was one of my favorite pieces of street out there, so that's why it's in the lecture. Um, and so here I'm doing, actually this is an RGB image. So this is uh, three 2D um, matrices for the red, green, blue channel and Um, here, this is just a two-dimensional Gaussian. I showed it as a heat map, uh, but basically the slice in either direction is a Gaussian filter. There's a question asking, can we use even length square as a filter? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Sorry, uh, maybe we can, we can um, clarify your question. I can, I'm happy to answer that. Oh, the question is, can we use filters that have an even number of, uh, even size number? Yes, like usually people use um, odd number filters, um, but you can in theory use even number filters. It's a little bit, um, like, Depending on uh, if you use if you use valid convolutions, I think something strange will happen to the output size, and you get like an extra pixel on the output size. Uh, I would have to think about this again. I just saw a blog post that says why to always use odd numbers. I mean, in in, in terms of math, there's no reason to use always odd numbers, but I think it will make it more complicated um, uh, to reason about the the size of the output. Um, oh, and so someone asked, what, what did I mean by gradient? This is actually an application of this gradient. So this is a Sobel filter, uh, which is a, a 
smooth two-dimensional gradient. And um, so this is um, a filter that's sort of something that neural networks often learn or that's, uh, and that's also traditionally commonly used in image processing. This is a gradient um, filter. So here I use the grayscale uh, version of the street out as my input. And if I convolve it with uh, the Sobel filter, this is the output I get. And basically what it does is it detects uh, vertical edges. So you can see a pretty strong signal here and here and here, but the horizontal edges, you don't really see that much. Like here, this line at the bottom so, uh, is basically entirely gone. Also the colors are, uh, or the, the darkness of the colors is gone and only uh, thick vertical gradients remain. And depending on sort of the size of the Gaussian, you would uh, get finer or wider edges. So this one here only finds really bold edges. So this is one of the ingredients of uh, convolutional neural networks. So uh, the weight matrices we usually have in networks will be replaced by these uh, filters and we'll try to learn these filters in a neural network. Another important um, ingredient is max pooling. Max pooling is a way to reduce the, the, um, the resolution of the image and accumulate uh, information. So um, traditionally, or like in the 90s, people use subsampling, where you basically just take the average of each two by two piece um, in uh, like more modern neural networks, people usually use, excuse me, max pooling, which means that um, you pick an uh, non-overlapping areas in the um, input image and you just compute the maximum. So if, you if your input image was like um, four times four as such as here, and you did two times two max pooling, which is by far the most commonly uh, form of max pooling, you will get uh, this output. So you basically in each of these two by two windows, you compute the maximum and you just replace it by the maximum. This is a way to just um, basically uh, accumulate the information that was instructed by, uh, extracted by the network and uh, reduce the um, resolution of the image. This is important if you want to do tasks in uh, like classification or regression. I mean, classification, I guess, is the more commonly uh, used task on, on images. Um, well, unless you do YOLO. Um, but let's say you want to do classification, uh, you want to basically have a single output or like a 10 class output, but you want it to be invariant of where it is in the image. And max pooling basically gives you an invariant by one pixel. Um, so if you, if you move your um, image by a single pixel, uh, then uh, at least, well, in this case, if you move it, uh, Actually, it's not entirely true. Well, it gives you some invariance towards uh, tr translation. Basically, if the maximum change uh, crosses over between the, the boundaries, then it, it will not give you complete invariance, but um, it uh, creates some invariance towards the position of the signal. And it, makes, it decreases the resolution so that you are able to um, make more global decisions. Because in the end, you may want to do a global decision on like, is this, does this image show a car, or is it an outdoor or an indoor image, or does the person smile, or something like this? Here is um, what uh, basically the, the father of all convolution neural networks. This is uh, from the I think 1989 paper by uh, Jan Lacan, uh, Leon Boutroud, uh, Josh Bengio, and uh, Patrick Hafner. And I think only, only three of these are still in New York. Um, Josh Benji was obviously in, in Montreal. Um, and so this was uh, on the MNIST data set. And um, they basically had this network that by, by modern standards is like tiny. And so this is now 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, they worked on this. Um, they had uh, six feature maps. So 
a feature map basically corresponds to the result of a filter. In other words, what this means is in the first input layer, so the input was a single grayscale 32 times 32 image. In the first layer, there were six filters. And these were probably uh, five times five or something like this, or maybe three times three. And uh, the output of applying a single filter is called the feature map. Then they applied um, subsampling. So they didn't use max pooling then. Now we would use max pooling, which just uh, reduces the resolution by one half. And um, then they had uh, another layer of convolution. So now they had uh, 16, con uh, 16 convol uh, feature maps, meaning um, there were 16 different filters uh, where each filter basically, how do I say this best? Each filter has different entries for the six input features. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that uh, in a little bit. Then they have another um, subsampling layer, and then they have fully connected layers. They actually, in the end, have a, a Gaussian connected layer. Um, Um, which we probably do, wouldn't do uh, anymore these days, but basically they have two fully, fully connected layers. So there's a question which is, uh, how are these six feature map different? As, uh, what is the logic behind having multiple feature maps? And so um, you can think of each feature map basically corresponding to a single hidden unit in some sense. So if you have um, an input image and you have a single, uh, uh, filter, you would get one feature map. A single filter, let's say it's three by three or five by five. Um, if we have a three by three filter, that's nine numbers that you learn. So this is not like a lot of parameters to learn. We saw before that we learned hundreds of thousands of parameters. And so, um, so this would be way less parameters than having a single hidden unit uh, fully connected neural network. And so, because you apply the same filter everywhere, this is, um, yeah, it's like having a single hidden uh, unit that is also really, really restricted, what it can do. And so multiple feature maps sort of correspond to having multiple hidden units. You don't usually have like as many hidden units, so like six or maybe like 20 would be okay, but you wouldn't have hundreds of them usually, um, except for like, modern very large networks in some cases, potentially. Um, but they're all different in that they ha have different weights. Uh, they're all randomly initialized, and then you do gradient descent, and then so they all learn something different. In the same way that different hidden units in a fully connected network learn different things. And I'm going to walk a little bit more in detail through uh, the different Um, through uh, the different architectures. Here's some other architectures that are um, a little bit more modern, that are not, these are not state of the art. We'll see some more state of the art ones uh, next time. So here at the top is a screenshot uh, of AlexNet. AlexNet was one of the breakthroughs. It was the first uh, neural network that was published on, um, on the ImageNet data set. Uh, and so here, uh, this was, oh, I, I don't actually remember. Maybe this was uh, 2010 or 2011 or something like that. And so um, I don't want to go through all of these uh, things, but you can see that there's a convolutional layer, then there's a max pooling layer, then there's convolution, then this is actually another convolutional layer, um, uh, max pooling layer, convolution, convolution, uh, max pooling, dense and dense and dense. And this was, uh, this is for ImageNet, which has a thousand classes, so the output layer is a thousand. The input uh, layer, there's uh, three channels, so you have, which correspond basically to three layers in the input. 
and it's 20, 224 times 224 pixels. Uh, the filters are very wide for current standards. They were 11 by 11, but they were only applied every four feature, uh, every four pixels. So they had a, a big filter that was 11 by 11, and then they moved it four pixels over instead of one pixel. Anyway, and uh, you can, oh, and you can see that it was actually split in two parts because um, it lived like on two separate GPUs because the GPU wasn't big enough. Like back then, probably had one gigabyte of, of memory or something. The GPU wasn't big enough to hold the full network, so you had to split it up to two uh, GPUs. Uh, these days, this network easily fits on a single GPU. Back then, it didn't. So this was sort of the first of the more modern um, uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, later on, uh, this is uh, VGG16. This is from 2016. Um, this is still, in 2016, basically the same architecture as um, this from 1998. So this AlexNet was like a huge breakthrough, and this VAG16 was still much better than AlexNet, and, uh, but the basic ingredients they're using are exactly the same as uh, 25 years before. And so here, the input image again was 224 times 224 times three. So it's uh, three for the RGB channels. It has 64 um, uh, feature maps. Then there was uh, a max pooling layer, uh, which reduces the, the um, the resolution by half. Oh, actually, so I sh what I should have said. So you can see that there's two layers here. Um, so actually, they had this 224 times 24 times uh, 64 layer. And then they had another convolutional layer. And then they had a max pooling layer. Then they had another two convolutional layers and a max pooling layer. Then they had three convolution layers, then a max pooling layer, then another uh, three convolutional layer, max pooling layer, and so on. So here they have a convolutional layer, not uh, sorry, a max pooling layer, not after each convolutional layer, but they have multiple convolution layers and then a max pooling layer. And so in these uh, max pooling layers, the resolution decreases and decreases. So here in the end, the resolution is only seven times seven, but there's 512 feature maps. So uh, the, the deeper you go into the network, the lower the resolution of the maps, but the more maps you have. And from this, you can then go to um, a fully connected uh, layer, a fully connected layer, fully connected net layer, and then the output layer with softmax. Um, so I want to see if I have a better explanation of feature maps and Okay, I should have, let me try to explain feature maps one more time and then I'll move on and I'll have a couple of images later that try to um, explain it again. So basically, um, each applying a single filter corresponds to a feature map. So if I, here, if I apply this filter, I get this output image. What we're learning in a neural network are, is not a single filter on the input image, but say we're learning six filters, similar to how we learn multiple hidden units in a full, fully connected neural network. We would learn multiple of these filters, and the output of each of these filters we call a feature map. So they all have the same size and shape as the image, approximately, and uh, they serve as the input to the next layer. OK, so at least one more person understood it. So that's good. Um, so now let's see how we can do this with Keras. Um, so I pre the data here, similar to what I did before. Now I reshape it to um, actually be image, image sized. So um, 
it's now the training images are like 60,000 times 24 times 24 times one. So for um, the convolutions, they always, at Hushnu Nets and Keras, they always expect uh, 4D tensors or 4D ND arrays. Um, so here the last shape is one because there's only a grayscale image. It's grayscale images, so there's a signal channel input. Again, I do the one-hot encoding of the classes. Then. So now I do um, uh, neural network. So again, this is like a tiny neural network because again, I was lazy and I did it on the CPU on my laptop. And so this is not really the architecture you should be using, but this is just an example to show you the API of the code. That's why I said this is a tiny network. So now to you, the um, layers that I use are, in addition to the dense layer that we had before, the conf2d and the max pooling 2d and the flatten layer. So again, I use my sequential uh, network. And so now I'm using the conf2d layer. So the conf2d, the first entry is now not the size of the hidden layer, but it's the number of feature maps. So it's, um, I created 32 feature maps and the kernel size is three by three. So the first layer, excuse me, will, will learn 32 of these kernels. Each of them will be a three by three uh, filter. The activation is rectified linear. Um, and again, the input shape is the input shape I, I defined before, which is, um, I guess, 22 times 22 times one. Yeah, 22 times 22 times one. Uh, sorry, 28 times 28 times one. Then I do another convolutional layer um, with 32 uh, uh, feature maps and uh, a filter size is again three by, oh, sorry. Then I do a max pooling 2D with a pooling size of two by two. And I do another convolutional layer uh, with 32 feature maps and um, three by three uh, filters, another max pooling layer. And so by now, um, the resolution is increased quite a bit. Then I do a flattening layer. So here the output of the max pooling layer is again a 2D uh, shaped thing. So it's multiple, it's, uh, it's 32 uh, 2D arrays, 2D uh, filter maps. And so now I flatten all of them into one long vector. Um, and then I use a dense layer. So of 64 hidden units, and then I do another dense layer for the output uh, softmax layer. Again, um, calling summary is uh, is your friend. Oh no, I should have not. So here on the left is a summary of um, of the convolutional neural network. Here's a summary of the network edit bef uh, of a different network. Actually, I rearranged some of the slides. So ignore the dropout here. We're going to talk about dro dropout tomorrow. Um, but on the right hand side, I have a dense network with um, 1,024 hidden units and two hidden layers. And just ignore the dropout. It doesn't really it doesn't add any more parameters. Um, and so if I do a dense neural network. So the, the number of parameters in the first layer would be input size times uh, 1,024, and the hidden layer would be 1,024 times 1,024 plus the biases, and then the output layer would be 1,024 times 10 um, plus the biases. So this is two hidden layers with 1,000 hidden unit each. This is on, on the left is my convolutional uh, uh, network, and the convolutional neural network the output shape of the first layer is 62 uh, 26 times 26 times 32. So the 26 here comes from me doing valid convolutions. So I, if I do a three by three filter on something that's a uh, size 28, I, so it, with uneven sized filters, I always lose filter size minus one mini. 
So here, filter size was three, filter size minus one is two. So I lose two pixels, the pixels on the exact boundary, on the boundaries. Um, so this is why I got 26. Then I do two by two max pooling, the resolution um, decreases to 13. Then I do another three by three convolution. So I get, I lose um, two pixels again. Then I do max pooling, uh, it halves again. So I think it just crops off one of them, so I, I lose lose one pixel here. Um, then I flatten. So here I had um, 32 filter maps or feature maps that are five by five each. The flatten just flattens them. So it's five times five times 32 is 800. And then from here on, I still have, I just have, um, convolutional filter, uh, sorry, I have just have dense filters. So here there's just a matrix connecting the 800 units that I have here with the 64 and the 64 with the 100. And so, I think I need to, well, we're not gonna get through all of this, so I guess we're gonna uh, keep with convolutional units next time a little bit, but, um, so what I wanted to point out here is that the number of total parameters in this network is tiny compared to the network under uh, the fully connected network. Because these are always, uh, so here in the first layer, I only have 320 trainable parameters because I only ha I have 32 feature maps and each has a three by three filter, which is nine parameters plus a bias, which is one parameter. So this is like a tiny number of parameters compared to what a fully connected layer would have. And so here overall, I have 61,000 parameters instead of the nearly 2 million parameters I have in the fully connected network, even though I have more, more hidden layers. And so this is something that is um, true in general is that the number of parameters in a convolutional neural network is usually much smaller than the fully connected network. Um, but the size of the activations is usually um, or is often much bigger. Here in this one, it's not really the case. It's, um, well, maybe a little bit. So here, the, the, the output shape here in the, uh, in the dense net network, because I have 1,000 hidden units, is 1,024. And here, the output shape is 26 times 26 times 32, um, which is like, okay, it's slightly more. Um, if you have higher resolution images, say I had 256 and 256 images, then the output shape would be really big. So in convolution networks, usually the activations are quite big, but the, the uh, number of weights are pretty small because the filters are usually quite small. Another important point that I want to uh, make here is that in the second convolutional layer, we, we again have 32 filters, but the number of parameters now is much more than it was before. Why is that? That is because um, each filter here looks at each of the features in the previous layer. In the first layer, each filter is just a three by three filter that looks on this grayscale image. In the second convolutional layer, each of these uh, 32 layers looks at each of the 32 layers in the previous, uh, in the previous layer. So instead of each um, feature map having a single three by three filter, it has 30 th 32 three by three filters. All right. Okay, here's like um, training evaluating it. Actually, this uh, performs quite well. Um, again, I'm loading it with Adam. I'm doing 20 epochs and do a 0.1 validation split. And you can see the validation accuracy is uh, here. Oh, no, sorry. This is a test accuracy. A test accuracy is 98.4. So it's uh, quite a bit better than what we had before even though there's only um, 61,000 trainable parameters. 
here's the filters. And so here I'm trying to illustrate us this point again, where um, we're getting the weights of the first layer, which is layer zero, and then the second convolutional layer, which is layer two. Layer one is the max pooling layer, doesn't have any weights. And so, damn it. I'm, look, I'm visualizing the filters for a smaller neural network. So here, this neural network, I actually, I have uh, eight hidden maps or eight feature maps. And so in the first convolutional layer, the filters are three by three. There's one input channel and eight output channels or eight uh, output feature maps. So this, this filter is a filter for the first feature map, this is for the second, this is for the third, and so on. And so each of them creates one output feature map. For the second one, the filters are three by three again, but now there's eight input channels. The eight feature maps from the previous layer and eight output channels. And so this means that, um, I should have plugged them in the rows or the columns here. I think, so this row, all of these filters here are applied to the result of these filters and summed up and give me one feature map. All of the result of these are applied to the feature maps from the first layer and give me another feature map and so on. And so you can see that there's many more parameters in the second convolutional layer than were in the first convolutional layer because now each layer looks at all of the previous layers. Sorry, not all of the previous layers, all of the feature maps in the previous layer. Ooh. All right, we're running out of time. So this is just uh, the activations of this, um, uh, this network. And um, with the uh, eight feature maps and three by three filters, so this is an input image. This is the eight feature maps. So the result after uh, uh, applying the eight learn and filters, and this is the, sec the uh, results on the second convolutional layer. Second convolutional layer is four by four, as we as we saw somewhere. Or, uh, and so this is the the activations in the second convolutional layer, and afterwards you get the um, the fully connected layers. And so you can see that maybe the, uh, the different units um, detect different things. So this one here seems to detect uh, vertical lines. So you can see here vertical lines, vertical lines, maybe like slightly slanted vertical lines. Um, um, yeah. All right. So I think we should wrap up for today and um, we'll talk more about convolutional neural networks uh, next time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Let me, so there's one question about the interpretability in neural networks. How can we get the importance of the features or something equivalent? Um, so there's actually techniques to find which areas in the image um, a network looked at to make a particular decision. So these are like instance level explanations. And this is like a huge area of research right now. I don't think there's like a gold standard. There's like many methods to find um, these, um, basically these are like attention maps that say, where did the model look at to figure out this image is a dog? Um, but this is something that is still like, I mean, using it is very established now, but which method to use is quite unclear, I think. And uh, it's very hard to evaluate how well these are doing. And so maybe saying, can we use the same procedures we already learned? Um, 
I mean, there is ways to apply line here, for example, but uh, most of the methods for interpretability actually um, use the gradients in some way. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have time to talk about interpretability there like in depth there's like a huge amount of literature um, and I'll see if how, how far I can get into this okay other other questions If there's no other questions, then uh, thanks everybody for joining. And uh, I'll post the homework as I said a little bit later today. I hope you all handed in your homework for, and um, I'll keep you updated on the status of the exam, which will probably be a take home exam.